Good day again. It's nice to come back and bring you a message today. It's a beautiful day outside and it's nice to see the sun shining again. Now, this is the third in my series of messages on John chapter 14, verses 6, which says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. In the first one, we spoke about the way, how the Lord Jesus Christ said that he is the only way to come to God. And we spoke about how the Bible tells us about that in the truth and now today i want to speak about the life about the life that the lord jesus says that he can bring us we read back at the start when i spoke about the way that jesus that in the bible it says in john chapter 3 verses 16 to 17 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but the world through him might be saved. Jesus came to give us eternal life. He died on the cross that we might have eternal life. But it also says in the Bible in John chapter 10 verse 10, Jesus himself said, the thief does not come to steal except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Jesus didn't just come to give us eternal life. He came, that was his primary purpose, to die on the cross. But he also showed that he could give a human life more abundantly as well. There are so many examples of what he did to enhance people's lives when he was here. And I just want to speak about a few of them today. The first one was in Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. Now, it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralysed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. This man had no life. He was paralysed. He lay on a bed. All he could do was beg, and his friends had brought him to the Lord Jesus Christ because they believed that he could heal them. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. These friends opened the roof of the house and lowered their friend down on their bed right in front of the Lord Jesus Christ while he was speaking. When he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. This is the eternal life that the Lord Jesus Christ can give. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They said, Unless he's God, he can't forgive sins. And they didn't believe, as we've spoken before, that he was the Son of God and that he was God, although we've spoken about that in the way. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? It's easy for him to say your sins are forgiven. There is no outward proof that somebody's sins are forgiven. But by saying rise up and walk, he would show that he had the power. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralysed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he'd been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. The Lord Jesus Christ gave this man's life more abundantly. No longer did he have to lie on his bed and beg, but he could contribute to society and support himself now that he was no longer paralyzed there were others that the lord jesus christ helped and in that time to be somebody who had a skin condition to be treated as a leper meant that you were an outcast you had to stay away from everyone you weren't allowed to come near people often you could only come into towns at night and you had to ring a bell and shout Un unclean unclean but as we've spoken before, the Lord Jesus Christ loves everyone, but he was focused on those who were the outcasts of society. And in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, we have a story of 10 
lepers. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem, they passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. They wouldn't come to him. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. In that time, if you had a skin condition and it was cleansed, you had to go to the priest and the priest would examine your skin and see whether you were clean or not or whether you still had to be an outcast. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ told them to do, to follow the rules and to go and present them to the priests. And as they turned and went to the priest, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus was a Jew and the Jews did not go on with the Samaritans. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are there nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus made these ten men well and they were no longer outcasts and they could live life as part of society. He could not only give people life more abundantly, but he could also bring those back from life. And the next story I want to speak about is one that we speak about quite often. And it's in Luke chapter 8, verses 40 to 56. And it's two different stories together. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Here we have Jairus, who's concerned for his daughter, his only daughter, and she's dying. And he knows that the Lord Jesus Christ can give her life, can bring her back to life, even if she dies. But he's interrupted. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. She had gone to all these doctors and it will tell you in the other gospels she had spent everything that she had and that she wasn't any better. In fact, she was worse. She'd had this flow of blood for 12 years and nobody could stop it. And yet she trusted that the Lord Jesus Christ could stop it. And she touched the hem of his garment and she was healed. Now she's concerned, what's he going to do? But he said, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well, go in peace. And while he was still speaking, somebody came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, so this is Jairus, saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Can you imagine being Jairus? You think you've come, you've rushed. You've asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come. You know that he can save your daughter. And yet he's delayed by somebody else. And you're told that your daughter has died. He would have been devastated. He would have been crestfallen. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. These people who were mourning ridiculed the Lord Jesus Christ because they didn't believe in him. But they said, she's already dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. 
These people believed the Lord Jesus Christ and not only was he able to help the woman who had spent all of her money trying to be healed and was no better, but he was also able to bring back Jairus's daughter. This isn't the only example of where he brought back somebody dead. You could say, well, maybe she was just sleeping. Maybe he brought her back just by waking her up. But in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 17, we hear of another time where he brought somebody back from the dead. Now, it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. This is the Lord Jesus Christ that came into this world. And he was rejected. He was despised. He was treated badly by all the important people. But his desire was really to help those who needed it most. Here's a widow. She has no husband. And it's her only son. And he's died. And he has great compassion on her. And says, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Very, very similar to what he said to the girl. Little girl, arise. So he was dead. He, he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all and they glorified God saying, A great prophet has arisen up among us and God has visited his people. They were correct. God had visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. So we've spoken about lepers and we've spoken about the lame man and we've thought of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ gave them life more abundantly. And the last one I want to speak about is a blind man. This is a story that I just love, that he had such compassion on a man who was just blind and could only sit at the road. Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by and he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. Can you imagine this blind man? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, shouting out and calling out to them. And these people are saying, be quiet. He won't be interested in you. You're just a blind beggar. Nobody wants anything to do with you. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people who saw it gave praise to God. All these people who saw what the Lord Jesus Christ did glorified God because they knew that he was God. And he gave them life more abundantly. So what about us? What can the Lord Jesus Christ do for us? It's much more than an abundant physical life. But maybe you think, and quite often in other countries, there's this what's called the prosperity gospel. Maybe you think that if you trust in God, your life will be perfect and you will be made rich and you will be able to get anything you want. Well, Jesus warns against that. In Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21, he tells us a parable. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul! You have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. 
then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. An abundant life is great. All these people were healed and could live and provide for themselves. But our life is short. Our life can be very short. I was at a funeral this week of a dear friend and she fortunately was a Christian. She had put her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and she lived her life as an example to others about how you should live. And she showed the love of the Lord Jesus Christ through that. When people put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, their life is changed. Their life is different. We think differently. Death, illness, our moral standards. When we spoke on Tuesday at the funeral, we knew that death was just a transition for Isabel, that she was now in heaven with God. We think about illness and we think about the trials, but we have a faith that God will not give us anything that we cannot stand with his support. And we should have different moral standards. We should be the one that stands up for a right. We engage with others very differently as Christians. Office politics, striving pr for promotion. What we do with our time. Our time is probably the most precious thing. As I've said, we are not promised a long life. In fact, our lives, we are promised three score years and ten. On average, we will have 70 years to live. And what we do with our time is very different. On a Sunday, we will meet together and remember our Lord Jesus Christ. We will also meet in the evening and study the Bible. On a Tuesday, we will have a prayer meeting. Last Thursday, I was out at Inverurie doing a report on a Christian charity that I work with, Share Africa. And we use our time very differently. We use our money very differently. We have this rich man who said, I have made up, laid up many goods for many years. I will take my ease, eat, drink and be merry. Christians should use their money differently because the life that God has given us and the life that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us is different. We should have an abundant life, but an abundant life to do things for him. And we have a hope for the future. When you read of people who have lived terrible lives and then they become a Christian, perhaps in prison or on the streets, drunks or people who have been addicted to drugs, there is evidence of this new life in them for all to see. It's like the man who had, whose friends brought him to be healed by the Lord Jesus Christ. His sins were forgiven, but he also had an outward expression in the fact that he was healed there. Our lives should be very different and our commitment should be very different. And when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it should be evident to everyone else that we are different. And that's what you see differently with people who have lived a life and then have come to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is evidence of this new life, this abundant life. Not only will we have eternal life as we are promised, but we will have a difference in this life too. Truly, when we look at it, the Lord Jesus Christ has said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Hopefully you've enjoyed this session on the way, the truth and the life. And if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you.